My name's Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. want to welcome you. Uh, those of you who might be newer to Hope, new to church, this is a time in the service where I get a chance to bring forth some, some treat, teaching from the scriptures, from the Word of God, from the Bible, and uh, hopefully you can um, uh, get a greater glimpse into how great God is, but also that he would, uh, my prayer is that he would tailor something specifically for you through his Word. Uh, don't know where you're coming from tonight, don't know what's on your heart, your mind. Some of you maybe might be on the cusp of making a decision to follow Christ. Uh, I want to pray that it w- we would meet you where you're at. Uh, some of you have been following Jesus for a while, and it's my hope that we would meet you uh, where you're at tonight. The, uh, the, the gospel is a, a fun thing to share. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, and it, it's made easier by the songs that we sing. That, those songs that we sing are rich with truth about who God is and what God has done. And when, he, when the, the, the songwriter asked the question, depth of mercy, can it be? Mercy still reserved for me. Is there, is there enough mercy, God? Do you, have I tapped you dry, or is there still some reserve, some still available for me? And unequivocally, clearly as I can, I want to say to each of you, yes. Had this communication card, and I grabbed it this week, not because it's atypical, but I think it's very, very common as to how many of us feel, and it reads this, this way. I would like prayer for myself as I struggle with the meaning of grace. The cross should scream to you the gift of God, the grace, the mercy, something that you cannot earn, some plan that you did not conceive of in your own mind. It was something that God extended to you as a gift. So this person writes anonymously, I'm struggling with the meaning of grace, and if that applies to me and to all my sins, especially some in particular that have been making a recurrence in my life. Depth of mercy can it be. Mercy still reserved for me. God, do you have sufficient grace to meet me where I'm at, to forgive me of my sin? Not, not just the first time, but the 50th time, the 500th time, the 5,000th time. God, does it run out? And I grab onto this communication and I put it in front of you tonight because I think that can be a common experience that we have in the Christian life. The Christian life is not always made easier, but made tougher and challenging. This is the service where you can ask questions or just state your criticism boldly with a microphone in hand. So uh, be prepared for that. We'll give you a a brief moment later. But I want to ask you a question as we get started. Imagine that there were a gadget, perhaps an iPhone application, an iPhone app that you could grab onto that would solve every single problem you have right now in your life? What would you pay for something like that? You couldn't get it as one of those free apps that you download. You would need to put forth some money for this thing. But, but how much would you pay for something like that? How valuable would that be for you? Now take it a step further. What if it wasn't just for you, but you could use that in the lives of other people? Maybe a spouse, maybe a boyfriend, girlfriend, a roommate, a best friend. And that you could take care of all their problems. How about not just the people you know, but what if it extended to the people that you didn't know? That you could literally change the lives of thousands, millions, everybody in the world. How valuable would that be? How much would you be willing to pay for that? Think of just some of the afflictions that hope people. People of hope wrote on their communication card just this week. Just grabbed onto a few of the afflictions, a few of the problems facing hope people. This is us. This isn't people out there. Some of the afflictions we've been going through. A lack of passion for God. Just think of that. Fixed. Just like that. How about the expectations that everything will work out and it's not? In work or in family? Somebody asked in prayer for anxiety in their life. Another for depression. Still another for a loss of a loved one. Still another person, a loss of a friend's child. 
infant. Struggles in finances. Drug abuse. Addiction. Physical or emotional abuse. How valuable would a gadget be that could just fix that? Make it go all the way. Some of you deeply love Jesus, and the people you're closest to don't. You can't fix it. You can't just make it right. Make them believe. Some of you, maybe even many of us, became aware that we have a relative in Africa that wants to wire us a bunch of money. And you're... You're like, I don't even know this person. Should I take that money? I didn't even know. I got, there's this king and I'm related or something. What's your issue? And what value, what amount of money would you pay to just have it fixed? There's a great SNL bit of a guy named Oscar Rogers. You know this guy? He's brought on as the special financial guru. And Seth is talking to Oscar Rogers, uh, played by Kenan Thompson, and he just says, hey, can you, you know, Seth kind of interview him saying, hey, can you help us understand what's going on with all the chaos in the financial world and industry? Can you help us out? And his counsel, his special wisdom basically comes down to two things. Identify the problem and fix it. But he doesn't say fix it. He says, fix it. Better be fixed. And then Seth tries to draw out of him more counsel, more more wisdom from this guru. And he just says, Seth, it's easy. Got to identify the problem and fix it. It's broken. There's the problem. Now fix it. And I think many times we can bring forth similar uh, lack of patience in our own lives, in our own spiritual journeys with God. So maybe we don't have a gadget that can solve everything, but how much would you pay? How much would you pay that even though you couldn't have the problems totally taken away, that in the midst of those problems, circumstances, broken relationships, that you could be met with comfort, with peace, with joy, that brings you to a place beyond your circumstances. doesn't take you out of them, but in the midst of those circumstances, that there can be a peace that transcends our own understanding. You look at the circumstances, you think, it's clear, this this sucks. But that this gadget could help you with a peace that surpasses understanding. That in the midst of a completely hopeless situation, you retain hope. How valuable would that be? And that, the second part, the second gadget, is what we're going after today. As we study 2 Corinthians We're three messages in to this Bridezilla Returns. (laughs) Uh, So, Scripture talks about the church being the bride of Christ, but the church breathes fire or something? Uh, No, the church is is a beast, uh, I guess. And so we threw Godzilla in a dress, and there you get it. Um, But we're we're, we're going through the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to take a look at Paul's interactions with this church in Corinth. And try and glean some things in our own lives. Steve got us started on this journey last week. Um, and I'm going to keep going in the, in, the, in the same vein here. Let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-11. to 11. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are comforted, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm. Because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed 
about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired, even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Steve started this uh, message last week, didn't have a chance to finish uh, due to time. We've been going after the topic, where is God when life falls apart? Where is he? What can we glean from the scriptures? So Steve got us started last week and he talked about we need to make a decision to praise God. Whether he's giving or he's taking, regardless of circumstance, make a decision to praise God. If you want to hear more, you can go back and listen to last week's sermon online. Who God is, Steve unpacked the fact that God is the Father of Jesus, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. What does he do? He comforts us in all our troubles. Not necessarily comforts us by taking us out of our troubles. The scriptures say he comforts us in all our troubles. And that God never wastes pain. For those that receive comfort from God, there is going to be a joy and responsibility to pass this on to other people. That the comfort that buoys you, you are to not just let it stay there, but as you see need, and as you see people out there who are in pain, in need of comfort, that there is a joy and also a responsibility to pass that on to others so that we can comfort those in any trouble. So that brings us to this week, and Paul's going to go after a couple examples where this is true for the Corinthian church. A couple examples where God is not wasting pain, he's not wasting the suffering experienced by his people, but he's able to bring forth a comfort, and not just a comfort, but hopefully a benefit for God's glory. So let's go there. Let's go to this week's scriptures here, beginning in verse 5. The first example we stop at is the example of Jesus Christ. It says, for just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. At hope, At hope, we see Jesus Christ as crucified, as one who suffered. The suffering of Jesus is real. He experienced pain. He experienced bodily fatigue. He experienced real temptation. The suffering is not fictitious, but real. And so we reject any sort of theology that would basically not contain some form of suffering. Theologians call this prosperity theology. That you will just essentially receive blessing upon blessing upon blessing and making the decision to follow Christ. That whatever you have as far as money goes, it will be doubled and added to. And any sort of material goods, cars, it will be added to. Any sort of houses, added to. And we at Hope do not see that in the scriptures. And I experientially experientially haven't had that happen. I follow Christ and all of a sudden I just get this stuff, just kind of this windfall of stuff. The gospel says that God is able to make our sins, though they be like scarlet, can be made white like snow. Those who hold to prosperity theology add to it, not just your sins be made white like snow, down to your teeth, whiter than snow. It's all coming up roses for those who believe in prosperity theology. And I hope we just don't see that in the scriptures. Look at this from Jesus. He promised suffering. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, 
and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man, about me, will be fulfilled. It's going to happen. What are those things? I will be delivered over to the Gentiles. I will be mocked, insulted, and spat upon. They will flog me and kill me. On the third day, I will rise again. Okay, Jesus predicts three times in the Gospels his own suffering, his own demise, and his own death. And if you keep reading the book, they all come to pass. Luke 23, 1 and 25 captures the moment where, where Jesus is handed over. Mark 15, 16 to 20 captures the moment where he's mocked, insulted, spat upon. Matthew 27 captures his flogging, that he's scourged, that he's beaten with a, wo- a whip. And then he's crucified. And he's killed. And none of us should think that we can escape some measure of affliction or suffering in this world. The scriptures make clear we aren't above Jesus. If it happened to him, we're not above our master. We're not greater than our teacher. We're underneath him. And if it happened to him, affliction and suffering can come to us. That suffering of Jesus overflows. But not just that, his comfort as well. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Nothing in all creation is hidden from the sight of God. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Do you hear that? Nothing that you've encountered or experienced from an affliction, suffering standpoint goes unseen by God. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. For we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That is good news. That is comfort. To actually conceive of the fact That Jesus came from the Father's side, made himself a human, became human, took on flesh, moved in the neighborhood, experienced the same earthly ailments and struggles and trials that you and I have. He can empathize. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through. And then there's this note that he did so without sin. So every temptation he faced where you and I, we give in at some point, maybe the temptation comes at us and we resist up to 40% and then we give in. Maybe the next time it comes around, we, by God's grace, stand up under 60% of the temptation then choose to sin. In every category, every time Jesus is tempted, 100% temptation, and he doesn't give in. And he doesn't sin. And rather that, than that being something where he then keeps us at bay and he says, stay away from me. He says, no, I have been tempted in every way and I've been without sin, so come to me. Draw near to me. There is a mercy and a grace that I can give you. Now, some of you, in the afflictions that I mentioned earlier, you're saying, I I don't have that kind of affliction. I've not experienced physical or emotional or spiritual abuse. I've not experienced addiction. And you might be in your mind saying, maybe I don't need that mercy and grace. I've been able to accomplish most of what I want in life. I've been able to overcome certain problems. Do not let your pride or your own wisdom or your own ability be the thing that you rely on. Look at this. We have an open throne of grace to help us in our time of need. Going back to our passage from 2 Corinthians, it's not just the sufferings and comforts of Jesus. Paul now turns it and says, if we are distressed, who's we in this? We would be Paul and his companions, those that are writing this letter, those that are traveling with him, starting these different churches, he says, if we're distressed, 
It is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. And so Paul is saying, all right, here's Jesus. His suffering and his comfort overflows to us. And all the sufferings and comfort I, we experience is now going to come to you. But let's look, let's pause for a second and look at Paul's suffering, his distress. Just one scripture on this, I, there's many, but let's just grab the one from 2 Corinthians 11. Paul has some other religious leaders that are saying, hey, hey Paul, you're not that great of a guy. And he's got to defend some of, of this. And he says, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more a servant of Christ than them. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely. <laughs> this is crazy talk. And been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And I could keep going. The, 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 the passage keeps going. But we're going to study it later when we study 2 Corinthians. So we'll get there. But just in those few verses, the suffering that he experienced, the depth, I mean, when, when I get done preaching here, I'm not worried that there's like some rabble of the city out in the parking lot kind of waiting for me like, all right, now that you're done preaching, let's take you out of the city and we're going to stone you. Which for Paul was kind of a regular occurrence. That was something that was a frequent deal. That he just, they followed him from city to city and when he got done preaching, they attack him. And so he gets these different lashings and he's imprisoned and facing death time and time again. But listen to his response. Listen to the comfort he has found in this suffering. From Philippians 4, it says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Some of you maybe even have that little verse memorized, or you, you, that last little verse there, you, you have it on a poster. Maybe you have it like printed out and on a mirror, like, got to remind yourself, I can do everything through Christ. Think of that, though, in the context of what Paul's speaking about here. It is through Christ and the strength he gives me that I know what it means to live with plenty or in want. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether I am right now finding and experiencing freedom, able to move about and preach and teach as I want, or whether I'm over here in prison, facing different persecution, lashings, beatings, and maybe even death. He's saying there's something I can do through Christ. Christ comes and meets me in my time of need. All these different situations, good, bad, positive, negative, ugly, and beautiful, and in that, I can do all things through Christ. For me, this is, this is challenging. To hear of the sufferings and the comfort of Jesus and the, the sufferings and comfort of Paul, I, I, I struggle to compare my suffering and what I've experienced in life to these two examples. I grew up on the mean streets of Shoreview, Minnesota. North suburb. Went to Moundsview High School. University of Minnesota. I now live in South Minneapolis, uh, not near Lake Street, but by the lakes. I can't point to things in my life and say just obvious tragedy, just an affliction that many of you can't understand. I don't, I don't have those. Some of you have those. And if you're in that place where you have been carried by God through some incredible tragedy, you are in the best place to turn and to minister to somebody else who's deeply broken. You are in a better place than this pastor, than some of our staffers, to minister to other people in these pews than the staff is. By God's grace, meeting you in your 
affliction and suffering and bringing you through puts you in an exceptional place to minister to others. So we have this piece of, of, of the suffering and comfort that Jesus, overflowing to, to Paul and his companions, and they're suffering and distress. And then he says, we hope that this is for your comfort. And that this will result in a patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. Paul is hoping that the Corinthian churches see what has gone on in Jesus' life and his suffering and his comfort. Paul and his companions suffering and comfort so that when they go through the same things, similar things, they will find comfort, salvation, joy, peace in the midst of incredible circumstances. As a pastor, uh, I, I try to it's my hope that I, I start to live some of these things, so that I don't just come up here and say, hey, you should do this. But then I don't ever, like, put God's word, like, to work in my life. And this, this scripture has been simmering on my mind and heart all week. I felt like I had an aha moment. Because when I have heard that he is the father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He is the Father of compassion, that He's the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our distress. I have taken that to mean, mistakenly, taken that to mean that God wants to make me comfortable. There is a God of all comfort that is real, that exists in the pages of the Bible that lives, but there is no God that is simply here to make you comfortable. And if you are right now in the midst of pain and affliction and suffering, that may be very hard to hear. Because it is our nature, it is our sin, desire that when we are in pain, we want to get out of pain. When we feel discomfort, we want to find comfort. And the fact that when God wakes up, if God were to wake up, that he doesn't have as number one on, our, on his to-do list our comfort, where we're not first, and we're not the center, and it's not about us, that's really hard to take. And I know that truth. But being reminded of it this week was hard to remember. That first and foremost, God is for his glory, his sh- showcasing himself to the world. That is first on his list. It's first on his to do, to showcase himself. And many times he will do that by coming, seeing you in your distress, picking you up, uprooting you, taking you out, and delivering you from it. And you'll praise him, and you'll tell others about how he ministered to you and took you out of that. But many times, he doesn't just clean up the circumstances. He doesn't just change it. He doesn't uproot you, pluck you out, and take you to a safe place. But he is willing to come and meet you as the God of comfort in your troubles. So that through all things, you might be able to bear up through Christ who strengthens you. Is there anything in you that is worshiping a God who makes you comfortable? For all you grammar snobs, that lowercase g is intentional up there. It wasn't a mistake or a misprint. We don't see that in the scriptures. Where God first and foremost is about you and your comfort. Though he is the God of all comfort. Listen to what Darren Patrick who's a church planter in Missouri, says, if you want a religion to make you feel comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. God calls his people to do many uncomfortable things in showcasing his name. Some of you in this room 
as young people are getting burdened with a desire to take this name outside these walls. And it might be down the street with a church plant, or it might be around the world. That is not a call that will bring a tremendous amount of comfort. I can't promise that. This might come with great discomfort to you, and it might even bring forth the possibility of the sufferings that Paul and Jesus experienced. And yet, God's glory is worth it. Jesus is worthy of it. And your passion is honorable. So go do it. Many of us are going to be called to daily, day in and day out, and where God's place is, continue to carry the cross that's in front of us. Recognize you have a God of comfort to accompany you. Let's keep going in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul's going to help the Corinthians to understand the suffering he's going through. And listen to this. I had to look this word up, so this is a biggie. Uh, the depth of comfort is commensurate. Huh? That's not bad, huh? Four syllables? Eight o'clock on a Sunday night, that's pretty good. The depth of comfort is commensurate to the suffering. What does that mean? That means if I've suffered little, which Korshamleski has suffered little, the depth of comfort that I've received from God is comparable to that. I have been comforted by God. But the suffering hasn't been tremendous, and so I'm not in the best place to come alongside you in your suffering. Others at hope, the amount of suffering they've gone through, whether due to some of these afflictions I mentioned, abuse, loss of someone special, expectations from family, friends, or themselves, spiritual affliction, the depth of suffering has been great. And the fact that God is able to comfort them. with the same depth and scope that they've experienced in suffering is tremendous and showcases how great a God we, we have here. And so Paul, again, he's going to say, I need to remind you of the suffering that I experienced in the province of Asia. What was it? Scholars tell us this could be one of five things. That's such a scholarly thing to do. Well, it could be one, you know? Come on, tell me which one. All right. All the LDRs are saying, you never answer our questions in class either. Um, the riot in Ephesus. Could be the riot in Ephesus, which is captured in Acts 19. Quite a stir that, that Paul gets going there. It could be a flare-up of some illness that was nearly fatal. Could be. Seems like less likely. Uh, an, unreach, an unrecorded imprisonment when he faced execution. We have several recorded ones, but maybe we missed one. It just happened so many times, we, we couldn't keep track of them all. Intense opposition from Jews, which was just kind of a given with Paul. We, we have it where they just followed him around from city to city. Or maybe it's nothing specific, it's a metaphor. But essentially, we don't know. When, when he's referring here and he's trying to help them to see the depth, he just says, I don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. But Paul has suffered so much that we can't actually track down which suffering he's referring to. So how bad was it? If we can't identify the suffering, we at least have these qualifications that Paul puts forth. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired, even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. Some of you know that pit. Some of you have been there, despairing even of life. You know that kind of darkness. And so if that's the depth and the scope of the suffering, how great the comfort that is equal to that suffering. How great the God of all comfort in those circumstances. He goes on and he interprets this deadly peril and he says this, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. This is how he interprets his deadly peril. So earlier on in the passage, he says, if we've experienced this suffering and then comfort, 
We have a joy and a, and a responsibility to pass that on to other people. But what does that do with my relationship with God, this suffering that I'm going through? Oh, well, that's, that's so I can rely on him more. And it just seems like Paul's bypassed in this whole thing. The fact that he gets comforted is of little consequence to him. Going this way, it re- results in greater reliance on God. Going this way, others are comforted. Through my suffering and comfort, I give it to them. Paul won't even allow himself to be center stage in this whole thing. This happens so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Why? Because he raises the dead. Even if I were to die, that's not the end. That's not the exclamation point. There's more to the story. God raises the dead. Two, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril. I got out of this one. And because I've seen that, he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to do so whether he delivers us in the midst of our circumstance, sometimes he'll deliver us out of our circumstance. And he, there might just come the time where he delivers us into the arms of Jesus here. Don't rely on yourself, but on God. Why? Because he answers prayers. As you have helped us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the grace, gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many asked you earlier, how much would you give for a gadget that could fix every problem you ever had or ever will have? We don't have that, but what we do have is a God who is willing to meet us where we're at in the midst of the struggle, in heart, in mind, and bring a peace that is beyond understanding, comfort in the midst of circumstances that are very uncomfortable. want to bring this time to a a partial close by offering up four truths and hopefully four gospel responses when life falls apart. Number one, God is who he says he is and does what he says he does. So praise him. Even if it's through tears. Even if it is through the words of somebody else because you can't even speak. God is who he says he is. When he says he's the God of all comfort, he is. And no doubt your experience to that as God of all comfort and the Father of compassion, your experience will change from time to time when he's giving and taking away. But it doesn't change who God is. I had a mom come up to me after first service after I had shared this. She lost her child in the womb, full term. When you're getting ready to go to the hospital to deliver and bring home your child, and instead you're planning a funeral, I can't imagine that pain. And through tears this morning she said, you know when you said that that God is who he says he is? That's true. And I'm sure to go back when she was in the midst and to challenge her and to say, praise him if even through tears, I'm sure is a very hard reality and a hard truth and hard counsel to hear. Be reminded, whole community, God is who he says he is. You may be in a place where you're not experiencing him as the father of compassion, God of all comfort, the one who comforts us in all our troubles. Just know that he is who he says he is. It's a promise. And maybe you can't see it physically, visibly happening, so take it by faith. Faith doesn't just, that's not how we initiate our relationship with God and then it's over. Faith is something we exercise daily. So in faith, believe he is who he says he is. Number two, you will experience suffering. Jesus suffered. Paul did. You will. You have. And you will continue to do so. So solidify now that when it comes, your hope and stay, your hope and reliance will be with Jesus. Solidify that now. There's three kinds of people. Those who are going into suffering, those in it, or those coming out of it. 
So solidify now that Jesus will be your hope and stay. Steve Jobs passed away this uh, week. And I don't know him. I know his gadgets uh, pretty well. Uh, we are a Mac campus here at Hope. And uh, we're going to take a moment of silence right No, I, I'm, I just... Uh, phenomenal creator, without a doubt. Ingenuity, dreamer. This guy accomplished a lot. Many in the blogosphere, those online, feel a need as leaders, religious leaders, Christian leaders, to kind of either put him in, in one spot or another. I don't feel that need. But I do feel like we can learn something from him, a, a, a commencement address that he shared at Stanford in 2005. So this is not the Steve Jobs of 2011. This is the Steve Jobs of 2005. And again, I grab this example not because I feel like it's atypical, not to highlight him and say, hey, he's the only person that thinks like this. I grab it because I think many people think the way he espoused some things. And so some, there's, there's some truth in here. I think there's some things that I disagree with, but listen to what he said in a 2005 commencement address. He says, no one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be. Because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you, these graduates. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleaned away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it is quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you will truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Death is a universal experience. Many people believe that the only reliable things we have are death and taxes. Many people believe that this is the great equalizer. That though we might have different socioeconomic statuses, different races, different access to wisdom and other such things, nobody escapes death and it's this great equalizer. And therefore death gets to be the strongest, the biggest, the greatest undeniable reality Followers of Jesus Christ believe otherwise. Followers of Jesus Christ who are trusting in what God has done through Jesus on the cross, not just his death, which is a substitute for us, but then his life, that three days later he was raised to life. If that happened, and I believe it happened, if that happened, that has implications for any person that has ever lived. For any person that will ever die, you have to wrestle with the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That is a change agent bigger than any other that you could put forth. You will experience suffering, persecution, maybe imprisonment, the possibility of death due to your belief in Jesus Christ. Will you decide now that he will be your hope and stay? No matter the affliction or the suffering. What we do with suffering communicates much. Number three here. So first, the scriptures are clear. Be comforted by Christ. And then pass that to others. We are Westerners. We are in a place where we can secure comfort from a lot of things, not Jesus. There are many things that I can go home and grab and take and consume and put on 
me that's just comfortable. And so there's a temptation in us to find comfort in stuff other than Jesus. So what we do when we're faced with affliction, small, medium, or big, I don't care what it is, this is where categories are thrown out the door. We're comparing our suffering to another person's. doesn't matter much. What do you do when you face affliction and suffering? It communicates a lot. So be comforted by Jesus and then pass that on to others. I want to hold up a hopester, uh, Lindsay Kolnick, who was diagnosed uh, with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she was going to undergo chemo treatments and radiation while going through grad school. She, she didn't take time off. She just, I got to do both. I'm just going to keep going. But that wasn't even the most impressive piece. That was impressive, though. The most impressive piece, and the reason that I wanted to highlight her, and there's other people at Hope. She's not the only notable one, but it came through her prayer requests. And it came through some of the comments that she, she shared. And so I Facebooked her and I said, hey, can I, I just want to share a little bit. Can I share a little bit about some of the prayer requests you sent to us and just kind of the way that you handled all that? I just said, in, in the midst of some really, really lousy situations like yours, God is able to bring comfort. And as he does so, our comfort's not the only consideration, but part of showcasing how awesome God is that he can be worshipped, trusted, relied upon in precisely these moments even when diagnosed with cancer well you may have not phrased it this way in the moment or even feel like you had this in your heart or mind 100% of the time I feel like your example is worthy of imitation, can I share this? and she said absolutely, share this story uh, I think the quotes you have here are dead on and how I tried to set my mind during my entire cancer experience Obviously, some days were a little easier than others. But just remembering that although it was a hard situation to be in, knowing that God was with me every step of the way was the only way I got through it the way that I did. I don't know how somebody could go through this without God. And not only that, not only did she have that mindset and that she was sh sharing these things, but right after she got done sharing her own prayer request on the communication card, she would list out other people that she has in mind to pray for. Family members and others. She wasn't willing to, even in the midst of this, and my mind just, I, it, the little thermometer pops up. I just take me out of the oven. I'm done. I don't, that's receiving comfort in the midst of tremendous affliction that I'm unacquainted with. And so she was in a place of being comforted and wanting to pass that on to other people. Hope, do likewise. Do likewise. And finally, the greatest suffering, the greatest suffering ever experienced brought salvation. There is no suffering that matches what Jesus Christ went through when he bore the sins of many. And as he experienced that suffering, God brings forth salvation. Salvation. In that, the power of God is unleashed, and he's able to save people. So never forget, never forget the power of God and God's ability to work good in the midst of tragedy and affliction. With that, any questions before we close up there? Mr. Ripley. You got to go loud, bro. I got this air conditioning. Okay, so the, the question, if I'm hearing you correctly, is seems like Paul in the New Testament, when he talks of suffering, many times he links the suffering to being a follower of Jesus. And yet, as I preach here, it seems like I'm, 
there, there's greater room for God to bring comfort. That it's not just the affliction we see, receive from bearing the name of Christ, but other, other facets and other, other afflictions. Yep. I think um, one of the things that if, in, in bearing the name of Christ, that's, that is associated with this, but many times it's affliction we bring upon ourselves, is, is that from disobedience. It, it, it is us, we, even though God gives us direction, gives us guidance, says, go on this way and you'll find life, we don't. And we choose an alternative. And there's, I think, consequence due to sin. But then there's also this peace. And, and, and it's weird, and many times as, as humans, we don't get this under, to understand, but there's this disobedience that is painful and yet should draw us near to God. And I'll share an example from my own life. Um, there was a time where I needed to discipline one of my sons. And after I did so, it was instinctive for him to draw near to me. Rather than run away, close his door, run off into his own bedroom, I was the one who both disciplined him and the one who was there to comfort him. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget when he then, after, after talking this through and working it through, he then nestled into my arms to be comforted. And I don't understand that. And I don't get that. But that's a beautiful thing. And I, and I want to be mindful of that when, when some of the things that I would qualify as affliction are, are God's discipline and to know that that can be trusted even in the midst of that. But I think it is, you know, uh, there is just struggling in this world that's broken relational stuff that is just like it's not necessarily sin it's just we we're just flat out on the same page and we see the world differently and we cannot get on the same page i don't know if any of you get paralyzed in relationships where you're just kind of like boy it's really hard because we didn't get that worked through and now i have to go to work and i don't have time to get this all worked through but i I believe god in the midst there's been times where he has brought a peace until we can get it worked through does that help a little bit any others before we in the cheap seats way in the back who is that Justin okay Okay, so Justin shared that, uh, can, you, can you expand on that, the concept of being comforted in our sufferings, in our trial, rather than the comfort that we all feel when we're delivered out of our troubles, out of our discomfort? Um, is it, a, is it a, a mindset? Is it some sort of uh, internal deal? And I don't know that I have a great answer, but there is uh, verses that talk about and encourage us um, in our faith journey, there's going to be times where God grants a peace that surpasses understanding. That there is something that, our, that, that God is able to guard our hearts and minds in the midst of anxiety-producing circumstances, Philippians talks about. And you have, and, and maybe you're like, Mixing the, the I'm, I'm praying, I'm seeking God, but I'm also getting good counsel. And people look at your circumstances and they say, you should go that way. And for some reason, even though the circumstances look better that way, you feel God calling you over this way. And they're saying, oh, it's got to it's gotta be a good path because it, it seems peaceable. And yet, of God, you feel called to go the other way. Yeah, I found it. Philippians 4, 7. Okay, so leading up to this, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, again, many times, 
I feel peace about something and I'm willing to move forward, even though others around me look at the circumstance and go, how can you have peace there? He says, it will surpass understanding and it will guard hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so I guess comforting in the midst of and through, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's something about heart and mind and God giving attention to us internally, I would say. And I think that can look di- a little bit different. For me, scripture memorization, God, God uses verses. And I was down front worshiping and it's just like, all right, I gotta, I gotta come up and preach. And God just gave me an image of, of Jesus kind of just in his dudeness, just kind of putting his arms over me. Kind of like a, a coach to a, a player, just kind of putting arms on shoulders. And I just felt like, all right, let's go preach. You know, I, I felt a, a comfort from that. So that's a little bit of maybe how I'll encourage you to consider that. Well, let me ask you a few questions here. Are you worshiping the God who makes comfortable? Or the God of comfort? Has an experience of suffering caused you to keep God at arm's length? Some affliction, some area of your life where all of a sudden you don't feel like you can trust God anymore. And you're keeping him in that area, hands off. Jesus, I trust you for salvation. I trust you to get me into heaven. But in this area of my life, with relationships, with finances... I don't trust you anymore. And you're keeping them at arm's length. Are you willing to let God, through his gospel, bring you comfort? Are you willing to pass this gospel comfort on to someone else? We get a unique experience here at third service that doesn't happen in the morning. We get a chance every week to go to the table. This is representative of the gospel of suffering and comfort. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he, he had a final meal with his disciples. And he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body being broken for you. Whenever you meet, take this and eat this in remembrance. And in the same way, he took a cup. And he said... This cup represents my blood being spilled for you. So as you take it, remember me. And this, this bread and this cup symbolizes the suffering and the comfort we have in Christ. At Hope, we don't ask you to be a member of this church or any church. We ask that you follow Jesus. And if you are following him, we want to invite you to come and remember Christ in his suffering and in his comfort that overflows to us. We'll ask you to come down, uh, grab a piece of bread, rip it off, grab a cup. You can feel free to take it up here in the front. There's room. Take it back to your seat. We're going to sing a couple more songs. And uh, we have the chance now to proclaim Jesus' death until he comes again. And as we sung before, he is going to come again. And there will be life eternal as a result. Will you pray with me? God, right now we remember your righteous life, the death in our place, the silence of Saturday, and then the glory of Resurrection Sunday. Not only that, but after a time, you ascending into heaven and sending your Holy Spirit into the church, into the hearts and lives of of believers. Thank you, God, for all that you have done, all that you are, and all that you will do. In Jesus' name, amen.